An Alaskan fishing town of 600 inhabitants was stunned by the horrifying news that a family of four, along with four deckhands, were slain aboard their vessel in 1982. The boat had been set alight and all of those on board had been shot by a .22 calibre gun. With the motive and murderer still uncertain, this haunting case remains as Alaska's biggest unsolved murder mystery. With the salmon fishing season coming to an end, the settlement of Craig, located in southeastern Alaska, was bustling with fishermen, eager to complete their final catches and return to their loved ones. The 6th of September 1982 began with a thick fog lingering in the morning air. The engines of the Investor, an $850,000, 58-foot Delta Marine Saner, roared into motion with a stranger on board. He navigated his way to a secluded area approximately a mile from shore, nonchalantly greeting a passing skipper with a wave, the sailor completely unaware that on the deck, eight people lay deceased. Abandoning the vessel at a cove near Fish Egg Island, the man returned to shore using the investor's skiff, returning the following afternoon with a canister of gasoline. The investor was set ablaze and the perpetrator rushed back to shore and subsequently vanished. Former police chief Ray Shapley recalled the moment he arrived to the crime scene. When I got there, black smoke was coming out of the wheelhouse, but there was nobody on deck. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Two days earlier, on Sunday the 5th of September, the Coolthurst family, Mark Coolthurst and his pregnant wife Irene, both 28 years of age, along with their children Kimberly, aged 5, and John, aged 4, were accompanied by deckhands Chris Heyman of San Rafael, California, aged 18, Mike Stewart from Bellingham, Washington, who was Mark's cousin, Dean Moon and Jerome Keown from Blaine, Washington, all of whom were 19 years old. They attended a birthday celebration together at a restaurant located by the waterfront, each taking turns at using a payphone at the laundromat. The investor had arrived to the dock later in the afternoon, however this was not particularly unusual, as Mark Coolthurst, a hard-working and popular skipper who was proud of his investment, would give tours of his boat. Like other fellow skippers, Mark and his family were winding down, excited to return home to Blaine, Washington. Irene and the children were booked on a flight back to their hometown on Monday the 6th, and Kimberly was set to start kindergarten that week. What happened on the night of Sunday the 5th is unknown, however authorities believe that the family and deckhands returned to the investor that night at around 9.30pm as a storm was coming. Their killer crept aboard and shot each individual multiple times with a .22 calibre. Speaking with other fishermen, it was reported that at around 6am the following morning, the boat was seen drifting around the dock. A figure was seen standing in the wheelhouse. A deckhand on the deckade remembered waving to this person. With the investor hidden from view in the cove later that day, a man purchased two and a half gallons of gasoline in Craig, boarded the skiff and sailed back out towards the boat. At 4pm, crew members of the trawler Casino witnessed smoke rising from the investor. They pulled away from the dock and headed towards the vessel. The skipper recalled, The fire was so intense, I wasn't able to get within 50 feet. 
On the way, they passed the skiff with the mysterious man on board, who eventually reached Craig Docks. Whilst passing him on the water, the skipper of the casino yelled, Look for anyone alive. Witnesses noted that the man spoke with three people on the dock and then disappeared. The fire took many hours to extinguish and the boat was towed to shore to prevent it from sinking. Upon initial searches, with the fire temporarily at bay, the bodies of Mark, Irene, Kimberly and Mike Stewart were found in the pilot house. They all had multiple gunshot wounds. The flames worsened once more and wrecked most of the interior. The only areas unaffected by the inferno were the boat's hold and engine room, as a sprinkler system had been installed. Once the fire eventually burned out, only bone fragments remained of the other victims. Jerome Keown was able to be identified, but it was impossible to determine whether the remain fragments were that of Chris Heyman or Dean Moon. John Coulthurst's remains were never recovered, however, authorities believe that the fire was so strong that it completely destroyed the body of the infant. Authorities spent months reviewing evidence and speaking to various witnesses, however, no solid leads came until around a year after the massacre. Fishermen in Craig at the time corroborated with each other in regards to witnessing a man believed to have been the culprit. The suspect was in his 20s, was Caucasian and had a pockmarked complexion. Two years after the murders, police arrested 25-year-old John Kenneth Peel, an ex-deckhand of Mark Coulthurst. He was charged with first-degree murder and arson. Peel told authorities he was working on another vessel during that time and had actually been in bed during the murders, and his defence later claimed he was making a phone call in downtown Craig. John Peel was arrested purely based on the fact he looked similar to the composite sketch authorities created while speaking with other fishermen who saw the suspect on the day the cool thirsts and their deckhands were slain. It did come to light, however, that the gasoline that Peel had bought that day was regular gasoline, not the white gasoline used to burn the investor. During a six-month trial in 1986, prosecutors alleged that he had fallen out with Mark, who then fired him, and this argument was their reasoning for Peel's motive to kill in revenge. The trial was based more so on circumstantial evidence, and the prosecution based most of their case on the fact eyewitnesses believed to have seen John Peel purchasing the gasoline that day. Peel's defence argued that the eyewitness testimonies were inconsistent, as many of them changed their stories or were not completely certain that the man they had seen that day was definitely Peel. His attorney also stated the possibility that Mark had been involved in some sort of illegal drug trade, which is how he made his fortune and how he came to be killed. However, there was no evidence presented to support this. Another idea was that Heyman or Moon could have been involved as their remains were never identified. The result was that of a hung jury. John Peel was taken for a retrial in 1988 and was found not guilty and exonerated. Maintaining his innocence, he filed a wrongful prosecution suit against the state in order to receive enough money to cover his legal fees and a settlement was reached and John Peel received approximately $900,000. Police consider this case closed, however, it is far from being resolved. Rumours continue to swirl in Craig about the truth surrounding the murders, however, it seems the answers are no closer to being found. Former police detective David McNeil, who aided in the investigation, said, They got the right guy. Just because someone is acquitted doesn't mean they're innocent just means there is not enough evidence to show guilt beyond reasonable doubt. 
Despite authorities' belief that they found the guilty party, there is no solid evidence to convict. Was John Peel innocent or guilty? Peel told People magazine that somebody out there knows what happened. Somebody was responsible for this. Somebody out there knows what happened, but I'm not going to waste any more of my life on it. Laurie Hart, the younger sister of Mark Coulthurst, agreed to meet with John Peel at a diner, having spent years of being convinced he was guilty of the crime. After their meeting in 2016, Laurie is firm of the belief that I don't know if he's actually the one who pulled the trigger, but I think he knows more than he's saying. Who executed eight innocent people and what were the reasons behind it? Was it an act of revenge? A drug deal gone awry? Perhaps a fresh look at the case with modern forensics would open up new possibilities. The mystery continues to manifest within the tiny fishing village, and even though it has been over 36 years since the tragedy, the family and friends of those who lost their lives continue to hope that they will at last find the answers they seek, and justice for the victims of the tragic events that unfolded on that fateful night. <laughs>